If you're anything like me, you grew up believing that there were literal sweet and salty and sour bitter, like there were all the tastes, like had physical locations on the tongue. And that's just how it worked, right? I, I remember learning this and seeing this on a poster in a health class for an elementary school or junior high. I can't remember exactly where it was, but I remember seeing this very vividly and being like, oh yeah, that makes sense. That's the salty part of my tongue. It's lies, people. It's lies. It's not true. That is the product of some very poor science that has since been very thoroughly debunked. And I'm going to be able to show you that and plenty more in today's video because we're going to be learning all about the surface of the tongue. And to do this, we're going to be using one of Ken Hub's 100% free articles. And we've gone ahead and left a link down in the description below so you can follow along. And this is easily one of my favorite articles that we have because it's massive. I'm not even joking. I could scroll for the next 30 seconds and we might still not be at the bottom. This is huge, absolutely huge. It has everything you could possibly want or need to know on the tongue. I'm gonna have to stop there because if I kept on going, we just it would just never end. So instead, I'm gonna come back up here and let's start breaking this down because the tongue is really fascinating. Um, and you know, because at first glance, it might just seem like this muscle that's kind of sticking out, but there's actually a lot going on with it. Now, the view you're looking at here is a superior view. So it's kind of like you're someone sticking their tongue out, right? It's like, uh, type of situation. But the thing is, what this image is not doing a great job of showing, because from this view, it's really hard to tell, is that there's depth to this, right? So if we look in this uh, posterior por uh, portion or part, you are looking down around the curve. So you can imagine like the tongue is curving and going down into the throat. This thing right here is what's called the epiglottis. The epiglottis is one of two structures in the entire human body made of something called elastic cartilage. Elastic cartilage is there to retain its shape. And that's because the epiglottis blocks off the airway every time you swallow food or drink. And so it needs to perfectly retain its shape to perfectly close that off and then bounce back, restoring the airway every single time. Otherwise, you'd be choking and not breathing all over the place and that's just not good. But what I'm just trying to show you is that it kind of looks like everything's on the same plane, but in reality, there's depth to this. Okay. So if we're looking at the epiglottis though, I mean, there's different divisions. You have these different folds. They're called the glossoepiglottic folds. So you have like one in the center and then you have these ones on the side. So the one in the center is called the median uh, glossoepiglottic fold. And then the ones on the side are the lateral glossoepiglottic folds. But what they do is they create these little pockets. These little pockets right here are called the epiglottic vallecula. And what's kind of cool is it can actually like capture saliva a little bit um, in there. In fact, if, in other species, like if you look at chimpanzees, they can even store food in their vallecula. Uh, and like, so like they could take a bite and ugh, be in the middle of the swallow, like it's moving back and then say like some other chimp comes at them, they could be like, ah, 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 and start yelling at them. It's really, really cool. You can't do that. You can't store food here because if you tried, it would just push the epiglottis down or it would just squeeze past it, go into your airway and you choke. Um, that's a totally different topic for a different day, but it's actually really cool that human beings are one of the few creatures on this planet that routinely chokes. And that is a product of the shape of our pharynx and our oral cavity. Again, I don't have time to go into this. My point is the epiglottic vallecula are these little pouches that are on the surface of the epiglottis and they're formed by the boundaries of those folds, right? So then you have what's called the palatopharyngeal arch. So the palatopharyngeal arch, which is right here, it's not doing a great job in this particular view of showing this. These are archways that go up. And so you'd see this more for like, uh, like looking into someone's um, mouth. But like this is an archway that is the actual transition point between what we'd call the oral cavity or mouth and then the throat or the pharynx. So this is kind of like the division point between those two. Um, so then we have the root of the tongue. And the root of the tongue is actually a massive portion of the tongue. It's the posterior one-third of the entire tongue. The anterior two-thirds is pretty much everything else you see here. So the root, this is deep, because remember the tongue is curving around and there's a lot of girth to it. And so the root of the tongue is actually pretty big. But on the root, that is where we have what are called the lingual tonsils. The lingual tonsils are one of three tonsils. And this surprises people all over the place. We can even see another one right here. This is called the palatine. You have one on either side, the palatine tonsils with the lingual tonsils. And then you also have the pharyngeal tonsils. 
All of them are going to do the same thing. They're basically there to help act as a screener. They're made of lymphoid tissue, which means like as you're breathing and eating, food particulates, air particulates, potential foreign invaders will meet these tonsils and inside of them are going to be white blood cells because they're part of the immune system. So that's what we mean when we say lymphoid tissue. That is going to be there on the actual tongue. All right, so then we're going to meet um, the sulci. So we have this one here called the terminal sulcus. So it's like this line. It creates like this V here. So I know if you look closely, you're going to see, we're going to get there in a moment. There's these little circles. If we just go right behind them, there's this line here. This is called the terminal sulcus. The terminal sulcus is what separates the root from the rest of the tongue or what we'd really call the body of the tongue. So everything you're seeing here is called the body. Sometimes you can also hear it be called the dorsum of the tongue. Um, I just call it the the flat part of the tongue. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what most people would say. But there's this little line here that is the literal division point between that root and then the body. And then right in front of it, these little circles, we're going to come back to these. We're going to look at these at a microscopic view. These are called the valate papillae. Uh, the papillae are like these folds of epithelium, basically like mucosum, mu mucosi and epithelium, and loaded on them are going to be taste buds. So we'll, we'll get there as we keep on going, but for now just understand like these are loaded with taste buds, but they're not the only part of your tongue that can taste because again, we've debunked that nonsense, right? On the side, you have the foliate, the foliate papillae. There are these vertical lines and they're on either side. Um, these are really special types of papillae. By the way, papilla means nipple. It just means a projection. In anatomy, there are nipples all over the place. So you have heart nipples, you have tongue nipples, you have skin nipples. Papillae is just a name for like an outgrowth. Um, what's interesting about the foliate papillae is these are also going to be loaded with taste buds, but the epithelium on the foliate, uh, the foliate papillae is non-keratinized. So keratinized epithelium just makes it tougher, right? Your skin is made of keratinized epithelium. And on the surface of the tongue, right, on the body right here, this is all keratinized because you want to make it tough. Because, I mean, just think about all the food and stuff that is just interacting with the tongue, the friction. I mean, even breathing in, like, like air is going in and out. That creates wind friction, right, air friction. So you need to be able to have something that's really, really tough. So all this, the epithelium on the surface of the tongue is keratinized. It's a very strong protein, but the foliate papillae are actually non-keratinized. So the sides of the tongue, which is where these are, are actually much softer, much, much softer. We call those the foliate papillae. All right, so then in the middle of the tongue, you have what's called the median sulcus. And it's just this division point, right? It's just like dividing between like the left and the right. All right, um, and then, oh, back here, I forgot. There's this thing called the foramen cecum. So the foramen cecum, this is actually the embryonic or origin of the thyroid gland. So the thyroid gland is all the way down here in your throat. But if we're talking about where it developed originally as we were growing embryonically, um, that actually happened all the way up here. And this is kind of the leftover of it. All right, so then um, the last thing to really discuss is just going to be your tip of the tongue. But we call this the apex of the tongue. So the apex of the tongue, by the way, is going to have a good amount of taste buds. So we're about to d dive deeper into this whole taste bud mystery, but I just want you to understand that, um, sure, you may not have sweet, salty, sour, bitter, umami parts of the tongue, but there are parts of the tongue that have more taste buds, which do make them more uh, efficient and effective at tasting things, but they taste all the things if that makes sense. So there is actually some variability in the tongue's ability to taste, but we're going to see um, uh, they taste all of the tastes, right? So this is that image. Now I'm going to go ahead and start scrolling down. Again, we're going to see just how many images and how much text is in here in what is so cool. By the way, you can see like the depth of the tongue from this view. Um, like right here, you know, you can just see like the maxilla, the palatine bones, the mandible. I mean, there is so much going on with these images, but we're going to keep on scrolling because our goal, <laughs> I told you, we're going to scroll for 30 seconds here, <laughs> is to find this image right here. And so what you are looking at is a zoomed in microscopic or close to microscopic view of the surface of the tongue. And we're looking at the papillae. 
So there are actually four different types of papillae because if that previous image we saw, we only discussed two. We discussed the foliate, those vertical lines on the side of the tongue, and then the valate papillae, which are in the back. Um, but there's two more beyond that. So let's go ahead and just kind of dive into this. I think that's going to be the best place to start. So what we are looking at here first are what are called the filiform papillae. The filiform papillae, which I always describe to my students, kind of looks like little blades of grass, and we've even highlighted them green. Granted, that's our standard highlighting color here at Kenhub, but still. Uh, these actually don't contain any taste buds. These are primarily there for grip. So like this is the most common type of papilla on the surface of the tongue. Um, and in fact, they can even be, they're really keratinized and they can be really strongly keratinized in cats. So if you ever could think of like a cat's tongue and like those hooks, those are called the filiform papillae and that's gonna be very effective for cats to help clean themselves, which is really gonna be important for their hygiene, obviously. For you, you don't clean yourself with your tongue or you shouldn't be, please stop it if you're doing that. Um, for us, it's more about manipulating food as we're transitioning during a mastication because you'll kind of slosh things around between the left and right side of your molars and crunch them and then you'll throw it back as you're swallowing it down and it's going to go into the esophagus. So the filiform papillae are the most common and we're going to scan back up to that other image and we're going to kind of discuss where we find these for the most part. But just understand this is the most common one. So then we have what's called the fungiform. So the fungiform papillae gets its name because it kind of has like this fungus or you know this, the fruiting body of a fungus uh, shape to it. Um, this one is gonna be loaded with taste buds, right? So you're gonna have taste buds that are gonna be distributed all throughout it. Um, and we're gonna see that taste bud in just a moment. But the fungiform are not all, they are all over the tongue, but they do have differing densities. We're gonna see that you have more of them on like the tip of your, or apex of your tongue and also the sides of the tongue. Um, but you have them all over. They're still everywhere. It's so you, again, are capable of tasting everything pretty much everywhere. All right, so then we'll skip over this image right here, and then we get to see those foliate papillae like we saw earlier. But in fact, we'll be able to use this image to even talk about those papillae in just a moment. And then we have those valate, but we can also see the valate from here. And this is the image I wanna focus on because you can also see like these sulci or sulci, these like you can almost think of like caverns where, um, so they, they, to me these divide by the way, have always looked like little Lego pieces, <laughs> right? like the male end of the Lego piece. Um, but these little plates like structures have these little valleys and inside of there are going to be taste buds. And so these taste buds, which we're about to see, um, I want you to think about like this, like when you are pulverizing food, <laughs> little tiny chemicals, are breaking off of that food and then they're going to be landing on those fungiform and going into the valate papillae or onto the onto those foliate papillae and they're going to be triggering the taste buds All right so um it's just like little chemicals dropping in here just like that right so um what i want to do is go back here and look at it from this particular view to give you a somewhat of an idea of just like how these are distributed on here, so the valate are only found right here, right before that terminal sulcus. That's the only location you're gonna find them. And then the foliate papillae are only found on the sides of the tongue, right? That is the only location for those foliate papillae. But if we're to talk about the filiform, the filiform papillae, those blades of grass that I talked about that are all about grip are everywhere, right? It's just all over the tongue. That is absolutely essential. And then you would have fungiform papillae distributed all throughout the tongue. But again, they're actually gonna be in a higher density all around this surface right here. So basically the apex and onto the sides is where you're gonna have the majority of that. So it's like, when you look at it, you're loaded with taste buds everywhere, right? They're all over the place. You're capable of tasting all of the tastes. It's just, you're gonna have a higher density around the tips and sides of your tongue. Um, interestingly, there's even taste buds located on the epiglottis, which is kind of fascinating, but uh, we don't really have the time to discuss that today. Instead, I want to scan down here, and this will be the last thing we discuss, and just give you an idea of what taste buds look like. Right? We're not going to go into everything you see here. That is the purpose of this article, and again, this is 100% free. You can find a link down in the description below and check this out for yourself. But the basic gist of this is imagine a chemical of something landing right here. And as you can see, all of these cells are converging onto one single point. And what that means is they are going to get triggered. Whichever cell responds to that particular chemical 
is going to get triggered and it's going to send an action potential and that is going to go to the brain. So what you're going to see in here are different types of cells. Cells that process sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami. Umami is a Japanese word that means savory or fermented. It's like a very meaty, proteiny, rich taste. Um, my point here is these are the five tastes. All of them are going to be converging at this one spot. So regardless of you know the chemical, the chemical will hit all of the cells, but it will only trigger an action potential in the specific chemoreceptor, the specific taste cell, that is responsive to that particular chemical, right? So are you a carbohydrate, right? <laughs> like, like, so like those types of things are really gonna matter for sweet, salty, bitter, uh, and all the rest of them. So this is kind of how that works. So then again, if we scroll back up, I just want you to kind of picture here, and say we go to this valate papilla here, like you're gonna have taste buds all over the place, right? There's gonna be taste buds in here. So imagine you're eating stuff and the little chemicals are falling down into the sulcus and then they trigger this and then eventually it's gonna send a signal, an action potential that's gonna go to your, to your brain and be like, ooh, you know, grandma's cookies and all of that kind of stuff. And to just really drive this point home, it's all over the place, right? It's all over the place. You taste everything, everywhere, or at least, you know, I mean, like, again, like you are a little more efficient around the edges, but for the most part, you can taste all of it everywhere. So I really hope you learned something cool with today's video. Again, you can find the link in the description below for this 100% free Ken Hub article. While you're down there, go ahead and leave a like. Uh, little things like that really actually go a far a long way and help this video perform better um, inside of YouTube. And while you're down there, also leave us a comment. Let us know what you thought of the video. Maybe tell us a story about how you were duped in elementary and junior high school like I was. I would love to hear it. It makes me happy to know that I'm not alone being duped in my, my education. That's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. <laughs> but I would love to know if uh, you're with me on that. But anyways, thanks for hanging out with me. I really, really appreciate it. And I will see you next time.